Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Father, please, through what we hear today, might we be those who do indeed acknowledge Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and persevere believing that. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the great promises that Jesus made to his disciples was that he would send the Holy Spirit, that God himself would come and dwell in his people by his Spirit, teaching and transforming them. Raises the question, doesn't it? How do we know God lives in us? Is there a sign that someone has the Spirit? It's a question our passage this morning helps us answer because it's a question which was raised by the end of the previous passage. Just listen to the end of John, uh, 1 John, that is, chapter 3. The last sentence says this, This is how we know that he lives in us. We know by the Spirit he gave us. You see what John is saying? We know that God dwells in us by his Spirit. But how do we know that we have his Spirit? It's a question that was raised by the end of the previous passage. What's more, it's a question which needed an urgent answer when John wrote this letter. Because just like today, there were many different groups in the world making competing claims to know God. And one of these groups was made up of people who had previously been part of the church. What's more, they were now trying to draw people out of the church, very possibly with claims that they were the ones who actually had the Holy Spirit, raising the question, how do we know who's telling the truth? Is there a sign that someone has the Spirit? Firstly so we can be confident that God really does dwell in us. And secondly, so that we can be careful and discern who to listen to. Is there a way of knowing whether someone has the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, yes, there is. In our passage this morning, John gives us a test, a test which helps us recognize the Spirit of God. It's a test which focuses on one key fact. Everyone who has the Spirit acknowledges Jesus. Uh, Not any old Jesus of their own invention, but the real Jesus, who we meet through the apostles' witness in the Bible. God in the flesh, Jesus. Died for our sins, Jesus. Everyone who has the Spirit acknowledges Jesus this Jesus. Let's delve into our passage and see that's the case. A passage begins, doesn't it, with a couple of commands. I wonder if you spotted them in verse 1. It says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets 
have gone out into the world. Uh, two commands, one negative, one positive. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits. And why? Well, because there is this spiritual battle taking place. Uh, see, just as there are two families in the world, children of God and children of the devil, that was 1 John chapter 3, just as there are two families in the world, there are also two spirits at work in the world. Uh, the spirit of God and the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. There is this spiritual battle taking place, and it's a battle being fought primarily with words. Because false prophets have gone out into the world, chapter 4, verse 1. That is, people who claim that they are speaking God's truth, but who actually teach the world's lies, um, like those who left the church, which John is writing to, who are now trying to draw other people away. False prophets have gone out into the world. That's where the battle's taking place. And so, says John, we should test the spirits, which looks like not automatically or unthinkingly trusting everyone who says they're speaking God's words, but rather testing what they say. Because just like a fake Rolex watch or a fake Gucci handbag can appear genuine at first glance, well, false prophets can at first glance look and sound like true prophets. And that is, some false prophets will speak and behave in obviously unbelieving ways, but others will use Bible words and phrases, even whilst teaching a different Jesus. And so John urges us to test the spirits. But how? H how do we test the spirits? Well, John tells us in verses 2 and 3, the way we recognize God's spirit is by asking a question, does this person acknowledge Jesus? We look at their view of Jesus. And just listen as I read from verse 2. It says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Um, notice here what the test isn't. I mean, it, it isn't do they say they have the spirit or do they think they have the spirit? I mean, it's possible for people to be self deceived. Uh, nor is the test to look for supernatural signs. Um, not that supernatural signs are bad. No, Jesus performs many, many miracles, which are signs pointing to who he is. But Pharaoh's magicians also performed signs. And so supernatural signs aren't the evidence. Uh, neither is the test to look for particularly authoritative teaching. A teaching that seems in some way supernaturally powerful or persuasive. Again, not that authoritative teaching is bad. No, Jesus and John teach with real authority. But so have some false prophets. And so authoritative teaching isn't the evidence. Because the test here isn't about how they teach. It's about what they teach, what they believe. In particular, do they acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Because that is the sign that someone has the Spirit. They acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Which means, first of all, they acknowledge who Jesus is. That Jesus is indeed God in the flesh, fully God and fully man, fully divine and fully human. One person, two natures. Everyone who has the Spirit acknowledges who 
Jesus is. And that's not all, though, because they also acknowledge what Jesus did. They acknowledge both that Jesus is God in the flesh and that Jesus came in the flesh. And did you notice the way that John stresses that Jesus has come in the flesh? I mean, he's talking about an event that happened in history, an event with ongoing implications. When the Son of God entered into the world and took on flesh so that he could reveal God to us and be crucified for us. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, a little later, is going to go on to say this. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son. Why? Why did Jesus come into the world? Answer, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came to die for our sins. He took on flesh to die in the flesh. And so everyone who has the Spirit acknowledges who Jesus is and what Jesus did, that he is God in the flesh and that he died for our sins. That's the test. It's not the only test. For example, Jesus himself says that we can recognize false prophets by the fruit they produce. However, this is a key test. The sign that someone has the Spirit is that they acknowledge Jesus, fully God and fully man, who came as an atoning sacrifice for our sins and revealed God to us. And so says John, don't believe every spirit. No, test the spirits. And that's exactly what John does. In verses 4 to 6, he applies this test to three different groups of people. Just listen as I read from verse 4 and see if you can spot the three different groups. 1 John 4, verse 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. And whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. You, they, we. One test applied to three different groups of people. Let's take them one at a time. First, in verse 4, John applies the test to his readers, that is, to followers of Jesus, just like us. And I think this comes as a bit of a surprise. Um, see, I was expecting John to immediately turn to the false prophets and basically apply the test to them, but he doesn't. He first takes it and applies it to us to reassure us and give us confidence. Because the fact that we acknowledge Jesus is a sure sign that we have the Spirit. Evidence that we are from God. Proof that God himself lives in us. In fact, says John, his presence in us is the reason why we have overcome the false prophets. His presence in us is the reason why we haven't listened to them or be swayed by them. It is precisely because God lives in us. The fact we acknowledge Jesus, even in the face of competing claims, is evidence that we have God's Spirit. It is the work of His Spirit. First, John applies the test to his readers, to us. Then, in verse 5, he applies it to those who have departed from the church. They, says John, are not from God. Because the fact that they deny Jesus is a sure sign that they don't have the Spirit. No, behind them is another Spirit. And the Spirit of, an, of the Antichrist who, like Jesus, has come into the world. And so they are from the world. That's an important little phrase. 
See, when John talks about the world, he doesn't just simply mean planet Earth. No, throughout his gospel and letters, John almost always, certainly very frequently, uses that little phrase, the world, to refer to people living in rebellion against God and without reference to God. And John says that everyone who will not acknowledge Jesus is of the world. And so it shouldn't surprise us that false prophets frequently sound like the world and are popular with the world. In fact, these may well be warning signs that someone is teaching falsely. We must be careful here. Having unbelievers agree with what you're saying, being admired by people who wouldn't call themselves Christian, they are not necessarily bad things, especially when we live in a culture that has been deeply and richly influenced by the Christian faith over 1,500 years. That said, when someone sounds indistinguishable from the world and when all of their teaching is happily affirmed by the world, and that's a serious warning sign. And given the world is a complex place full of many different beliefs and uh, philosophies, uh, there are a number of different ways to speak from the world's perspective as well. There isn't just sort of one vanilla way that, that you can sound like the world. And I wonder whether there's a danger that we're prone to associating the world with perhaps progressive and liberal, traditionally left-wing values, and what's sometimes called woke ideology. But there is a right-wing, anti-woke world as well, and it's possible to become popular in the world by teaching its values too, appearing on its podcasts as well. There are multiple ways to speak from the world's perspective. And false prophets, though they might identify as Christian, will often sound like and be loved by the world, even as they communicate with Bible words and phrases. The second group John applies this test to is the group who have departed from the church. Finally, in verse 6, he applies it to himself and the apostles. They, of course, acknowledge Jesus, which is a sure sign that they have the Spirit and are from God. But that's not all, though, because whilst John and the apostles are like us in that they acknowledge Jesus, there is one significant way in which they are unlike us. Because unlike us, they are his appointed eyewitnesses. See, having spent three years with Jesus... They were appointed by Jesus to teach people about Jesus. And so says John, everyone who knows God listens to me and the other apostles. Now, conversely, if someone refuses to listen, well, then that is a sure sign that they are not from God. In fact, says uh, John, right at the end of our passage, this is how we recognize the Spirit. See, as well as asking, do they acknowledge Jesus, we also ask, do they listen to his apostles? And not that those are two unconnected tests. No, they go hand in hand. Because where is it that we meet the real Jesus? God in the flesh who died for our sins. Well, we meet him through the apostles' witness at which the recipients of this letter got direct from John, and which we today find in the New Testament. The real Jesus is the Jesus we meet in the Bible. And so what is the sign that someone has the Spirit? Well, it's not that I receive new revelation from the Spirit to me, but that I trust the historic revelation of Jesus to the Apostles. Um, and it's not that I have supernatural experiences of the Spirit now, but that I trust the apostles' experience of Jesus in history. Trusting, believing, acknowledging Jesus. That 
is the work of the Spirit, the sure sign that someone has the Spirit. And so here we have one test, one test to help us recognize the Spirit of God, one test with at least two important implications, confidence and caution. Firstly, confidence. Uh, Does this not give us confidence as followers of Jesus that we really are children of God? Confidence in the face of doubts. Doubts whether we're really part of God's people. I remember being part of a Bible study group with someone who often struggled with doubts. Were they really part of God's people? Even in the most positive of Bible studies, they could come away concerned. And perhaps you've had that experience as well. Well, here is a, a precious truth. The sure sign that someone has the Spirit is that they acknowledge Jesus. And so the fact that we, that you, listen to the apostles and trust Jesus is solid evidence that God is at work within you, that God dwells in you. Is this not a truth we can encourage each other with? When a Christian brother or sister is struggling with those doubts, we can reassure them, the fact you acknowledge Jesus is evidence that God is in you. Your faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. You are one of God's children. This gives us confidence in the face of doubts. What's more, doesn't it give us confidence in the face of competing claims? And we are surrounded, aren't we, by people and groups who claim that they are the ones who truly know God, that they are God's genuine people, which can be very unsettling, especially when those making the claim used to be part of the church. As those who acknowledge Jesus, we have God dwelling within us by his Spirit. And he is far greater than the one at work in the world. We can be confident. That's why the church has not only stood firm for 2,000 years, but grown And so, as those who acknowledge Jesus, we can be confident. First key application, confidence. The second, caution. Because there are two spirits at work in the world, the spirit of God and the spirit of the Antichrist. And so, we need to be discerning. Not believe everything we hear, but rather test what being said. And the application here is not to sort of remove ourselves from the world because we fear false teaching, but to be careful in the world because we're aware there is false teaching. And this is a call for discernment rather than detachment. To test what we hear, including when I'm speaking. Does this teaching deny Jesus? God in the flesh, Jesus, died for our sins, Jesus, who we meet through the apostles' witness. And sometimes this teaching will come directly from preachers and teachers, the false prophets of the passage on the TV or radio, in newspaper articles or books, tragically, sometimes, and from church pulpits. Often, though, we come into contact with teaching like this secondhand, as it were, and through those influenced by false teaching, friends, colleagues, neighbors, the films we watch, the novels we read, none of them kind of deliberately setting out to deny Jesus. They've just picked up the wrong ideas. And so we need to be discerning. And see, Christians are believers, but we don't believe everything we hear. And just because a teacher is popular doesn't mean they're true. Sometimes false teaching will be obvious. And for example, when a celebrity atheist argues Jesus never existed, or or a Muslim apologist argues that Jesus isn't God and didn't die on the cross. And sometimes it's more subtle, though. 
For example, if someone teaches a Jesus who is a little bit different from or in some way contrasts to the God of the Old Testament. Or someone teaches a Jesus who only ever affirms us uh, rather than ever exposing our sin or deserving our total devotion. And those are denials of who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. Or, for example, if someone downplays sin so that it, it doesn't actually deserve judgment and death. And that leads to a denial of who Jesus is, that, uh, sorry, of what Jesus did, that he died for our sin. And sometimes it's in what people say, sometimes it's in what isn't said. For example, teaching an, a Jesus who is only loving and never holy or just. A cross which is only an example and never an atoning sacrifice. There's that famous saying, isn't there? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, we want Jesus, the whole Jesus, and nothing that's not Jesus. Let's be discerning. And the call here is not to hunt heresy, like we've all got our own individual mission to go and find it wherever we can, turn over every rock. No, the call is not to hunt heresy, but to stick with the truth, which will involve weighing what we hear and asking the question, does this acknowledge or deny Jesus? And where Jesus is denied, whether explicitly or implicitly, well, then we should resist and reject that teaching. We should test the spirits. And we do so with confidence. Confidence because we acknowledge Jesus. And that is the sure sign that we have the Spirit. Solid evidence that God lives in us. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, thank you so much that you dwell in us by your Spirit. Please, Father, grow our confidence that that is the case, that our faith in Jesus is real evidence of the work of the Spirit in us. And please, Father, help us to be discerning with what we hear and listen to, and to not believe everything, but to test what we hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. And having seen that as followers of Jesus, God dwells in us by his Spirit, our final song is all about the wonderful work of the Spirit. <laughs>
hope. Fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.